In this fi the fifth lecture of the series, we begin a new unit, lectures five to eight, that will focus on the efforts of such neoclassical theorists as Horace, Longinus, Sidney, Dryden, and Pope to discern, systematize, and record for posterity the artistic elements and critical rules and regulations that made classical poetry the envy of the world. We begin in this lecture with a close look at Horace's verse epistle, The Art of Poetry. After introducing Horace and his age, we shall enumerate Horace's rules and regulation for writing great poetry. With Horace, we now move into the second unit. The first unit was classical theory. This second unit, lectures five to eight, is neoclassicism. In the writings of Horace, Longinus, Sidney, Dryden, and Pope, we see a deliberate, self-conscious desire to imitate the classical world. The word neoclassical in Greek means new classical. And the neoclassical theorists, starting with Horace and going right on up to Alexander Pope, look back to the classical age as their model. And they're very deliberate and self-conscious in their imitation of the classical world. Virgil's Aeneid would be neoclassical because it imitates the classical Homer, to give you a poetic example. Now, in this lecture, we'll look at Horace. In the next lecture, we'll look at Longinus. Both of these men lived in the Roman world, and they looked back to the great writers of Greece and attempted to assess why they were so successful. So both this lecture, Horace, and the next one on Longinus are Romans looking back to the Greeks and trying to figure out why their poetry was so great. Then, in Lecture 7, we're going to jump way ahead to the Renaissance and look at Sir Philip Sidney and his attempt to revive the glories of ancient literature and to defend this revival along Aristotelian and Horatian lines. Notice that Sidney now is not only imitating Aristotle, but he's imitating Horace. So neoclassicists sometimes even imitate other neoclassicists. They like to imitate and to uh, try to figure out why they were great and move on. Finally, in our eighth lecture, we will move to England and look at John Dryden and Alexander Pope. They lived in the British neoclassical age, which actually modeled itself on Rome. And Dryden and Pope sought to do for their contemporary poets what Horace had done for his. That is, systematize the rules of poetry. Again, that's a brief overview of the unit, so uh, we'll pick up on all those themes, but I want you to see the relationship between these thinkers. This, this unit is the most spread out chronologically, because it takes us uh, about 1,800 years, but they all fit under this rubric, and you'll see as we go through the unit. All right, let me have a few opening comments on Horace before we look at his essay. First of all, Horace was one of the great poets of Rome's Augustan age. It was called the Augustan age after Caesar Augustus, the first emperor. Some would say Julius Caesar, but really Caesar Augustus, the first emperor of Rome. And he reigned from 27 BC to 14 AD. And his reign is known as the Augustan Age, and it is the golden age of Roman poetry. There are other great Roman poets later, but this is the golden age, comparable to the 5th century BC golden age of Sophocles. Now, this golden age included not only Horace, but Virgil, who wrote the Aeneid, Ovid, and two lyric poets, Propertius and Tibullus, and others, but those are the main figures we associate with the Augustan age. Horace, who was almost a leader of the group, was a master of the short lyric and the very embodiment of wit. Horace did, was not given to long epic works like the Iliad and the Odyssey. He liked short lyric pieces that were very witty and had lots of turns of phrase. And Horace is a poet who suffers greatly in translation because he likes to play on words very, you know, it's not this wonderful uh, narrative thrust of Homer. It's words. And so he does not translate very well. You really need to know Latin to really appreciate him. Now, in his age, the Augustan age, Horace became a model of the courtly poet who could move around in high and even royal society without prostituting his talents or his arts. This is something that's hard for us still living in a romantic age to believe. We believe if we're writing for a noble, then we're going to be bastardizing our art. Horace did not. He, he made the, the rich people happy, if you will, and he wrote great art. This is something we've kind of forgotten how to do, I think. Horace could teach us.
Let's move on now to his work. The work that he wrote, his contribution to literary theory, in Latin it's known as Ars Poetica. In English it's translated the art of poetry. And it does go by both names. Now, the art of poetry, although it is generally translated into prose, is actually what we call a verse epistle. In other words, a letter written in poetry. And this verse epistle is addressed to the Piso family. Thus, it's often called the epistle to the Pisos as well. And the Pisos were patrons of Horace. In this letter, The Art of Poetry, Horace is purportedly giving advice to the two Piso boys on how to write great poetry. Although Horace did intend for it to be published, so to speak. It's written to the Pisos, but he meant it to be a public letter very public man as a poet. Now the funny thing is, although it's supposed to be giving them advice on how to write great poetry, it is really a none too subtle appeal to the two boys and their father to give up poetry. Today we would use the, qu the quip, don't quit your day job. That is literally what he is saying to the Piso boys. All right, you're trying hard, but he's saying it very subtly. With much irony and wit, Horace advises the boys to put their poetry in a closet for nine years before showing it to the public. He's wonderful. And I've got to say, enjoy these neoclassical lectures, because this is one of the few places where there's comedy in literary theory. Literary theory is a pretty serious business, being philosophical and whatnot. But the, the neoclassical people put such an emphasis on wit that there's a lot of humor. And again, some of it's lost in translation, but you can pick up on it. If you read Horace carefully, you'll see what he's doing. Horace is a master of what we call the ironic pose. In fact, in his Art of Poetry, he expresses contempt for critics who flatter their patrons instead of telling them the truth. What is he saying to them? Now, boys, I'm not going to flatter you, but that's because I'm a great poet. In fact, you wouldn't want me to flatter you because then I'd be a great poet. Why do you want to patronize me? So there's a lot of, of wit here. It's very subtle. I don't know if the Pizzo boys pick up, picked up on it. We do, and it makes it a much, I don't know, more of a fun read, a lot of wit. Now, in The Art of Poetry, Horace offers an influential view of the proper role of the critic. Now, we said that Aristotle showed the critic as someone who can inspire great art, but Aristotle only does that indirectly. I'm reading that in. It's there, but I'm reading it into it. Horace actually states, he comes out and says what the role of the critic should be. And he says, in a famous definition, a critic is a whetstone against which poets can sharpen their work. Right? A whetstone, you take a knife and sharpen it against the whetstone. Well, that's what a critic that's his function, for poets to, to, to sort of sharpen themselves against the critic. The purpose of the whetstone, Horace says, is not itself to write great poetry, but to teach the proper duty and office of the poet. Now, of course, it turns out that Horace was a great poet, but you don't have to be. He is saying that a critic doesn't have to be a great poet. He just needs to understand it and appreciate it and be able to teach poets what their duty is, what they should be doing as poets. Now, part of this, of this duty is to censure and edit poetry that either uses the wrong material or handles that material in an inappropriate way. That's the role of the critic, and it goes back to that genre criticism of what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. And it's the critic's job to point out what is or is not appropriate in case the poet doesn't notice. Now, you'll remember this word. The laws that dictate what is and is not appropriate for poetry constitutes the central and foundational notion of all neoclassical art, and you may remember the word was decorum. Again, decorum are the laws that dictate what is and is not, is not appropriate for poetry. And neoclassicists are completely committed to the idea of decorum. Let's look at some of Horace's specific rules. At the heart of decorum, Horace says, is the stipulation not to mix unlike things. In fact, Horace illustrates this in the very first uh, rhyming couplet, the rhyming couplets, in the very beginning couplet of his verse epistle, he lampoons the image of a mermaid. He says, only a foolish poet would create a mermaid, take a, a fish and a woman and put them together. 
that breaks decorum because you're not supposed to mix unlike things. And so he makes fun of that as being fanciful. It's the product of a feverish mind, some crazy person making these, you know, uh, co concoctions that shouldn't go together, breaking decorum. Now, more specifically, after giving us the comic image, Horace gets serious and attacks poets who mix genres, who use, let's say, comic subjects as the basis of tragedy or, or vice versa. Now, interestingly, the great Shakespeare breaks decorum. Some of his tragedies have comic relief, and some of his comedies have tragic overtones. Horace would not have approved. Tragedy is tragedy, and comedy is comedy, and never the twain shall meet. You don't mix genres. That is one of the uh, key points of decorum. Everything's got its proper place. Each genre should have its own style that is natural to it. Again, there's that genre, uh, the idea of there are certain modes of imitation appropriate to epic or to tragedy or to comedy. There should be an unbroken, clearly defined unity of action, character, and mood. We don't want things breaking it up. We want unity. We want things that fit together. Indeed, according to Horace, each genre should have its own specific meter. A meter whose rhythmic sounds mimic closely the sense of the poem. In other words, Horace gets, you know, pretty stipulative. He says, if you're writing an elegy, you know, a, a grieving about the loss of a person or a, a community, you should have a metrical scheme that has an elegiac sound to it. In other words, it should be long and mournful. Or if you're writing something meditative, the sound of the poetry itself should be meditative. If you're going to do a serious tragedy, don't give me a sing-songy rhythm. That is breaking decorum. There must be a fittingness between the sound and the sense. Those must go together as one. Now, another example or, or uh, of, uh, aspect of decorum. When writing on a traditional subject, quote, modern poets or contemporary poets must be faithful to the literary precedents set by their poetic forebears. In other words, what Horace gives an example. If you're going to do a modern portrayal of Achilles or Orestes or Oedipus, you know, you're going to do them again, you must be consistent with earlier portrayals. In other words, if you're going to write about Achilles, you better be consistent with Homer's version of Achilles. We don't want any revisionist myth-making going on here. Now, Shakespeare breaks that decorum too. I don't know if any of you have read his early play, Troilus and Cressida, but that is Shakespeare's version of the Trojan War. All of the characters from the Iliad are in there, but they are buffoons. Achilles is a spoiled brat. Menelaus, the husband of Helen, is merely dismissed as a cuckold. It's amazing. For Homer and Horus must have been spinning in their grave. Uh, so again, uh, Shakespeare does not always follow decorum. He breaks it. But the real rules of decorum for neoclassical poetry says you must be consistent. Now this is interesting. What, what Horace is doing here is two things. First, he is reiterating Aristotle's rule that tragic heroes must be both appropriate and consistent. He agrees. But what he's doing here is he's inscribing this within an accepted tradition. So in other words, character should be appropriate and consistent, not just because that's the natural way of doing it, but because that's what Aristotle said. So again, uh, neoclassic people go back to authority and tradition, and they try to stick with tradition rather than breaking with tradition. Now, in addition to the notions of what is appropriate and what is traditional, decorum also stipulates what is fit or proper to be shown publicly. There's a lot of aspects of dimension. Here's an aspect that deals with the stage particularly. According to Horace, gory, explicit scenes must be kept off the stage. Such scenes of suffering should be related by a messenger. And anybody that's a thespian, an actor, if you're ever in a Greek tragedy, you actually want the role of the messenger. See, in most tragedy, it's a thankless role, but not in Greek tragedy. Because in Greek tragedy, Oedipus does not blind himself on stage. Jocasta does not strangle herself. You don't show that on stage. That's a break in decorum. What happens is the act, the bloody act, the deed, occurs off stage, And then a messenger runs in all wild and says, Oh my, I have just seen the most horrible scene. And in beautiful poetry describes the death of Jocasta or the blinding of Oedipus. So actually, again, it's kind of a joke amongst actors. If it's Greek theater, 
consider you want the messenger. He only has one speech, but it's a juicy one. Now, let's think. Does Shakespeare follow this rule? Not at all. Shakespeare loves to have death and destruction and mayhem all over his stage. Now, part of the reason is because he's appealing to the aristocrats and the poor people, right? He's you know, got a wider audience. He's not a courtly, just a courtly audience. There's the poor people in the gallery. The best example of a gory scene that would have horrified Horace, many of you know the play King Lear. There's a scene in King Lear where the evil Cornwall blinds Gloucester, and he actually plucks his eyeballs out. And there's a scene on stage where he plucks out his eyeball, throws it on the ground, and I think steps on it while he says, Out, vile jelly, where is thy luster now? This is a definite break in decorum. All right, uh, another rule of decorum. Related to decorum is Horace's famous comparison of poetry to painting. According to Horace, just like with painting, some poems are best viewed close up, while other poems are best viewed far away. And that's sometimes true with painting. Think of impressionist paintings. You do not want to stand right up to them, right? They, you, get, you have to stand back to get the, the right perspective. Well, he said that it's the same way with poetry. Some paintings are seen better uh, in shadows, others are better in light. It's the same thing with poetry. That's not exactly decorum, but it's related to decorum. Now, I should say here that in later neoclassical theory, a lot of people pick up on this idea that a poem is like a picture, and they really go overboard with it. And, and, and I think they really took it out of its context and made it sort of static. I don't think Horace meant to say poetry and painting is the same thing. He just wanted the analogy I made of close up or farther away. But that's something that becomes a, a type, I suppose, of neoclassical theory. You get, you get to hear it a lot. All right, those are the rules of decorum. But Horace lays down a lot of other rules, and I'd like to survey those as well. First of all, after his view on decorum, Horace is best known for his stipulation that the proper end or goal of poetry is to please and teach. The Latin, dulce et utile. Dulce, sweet. Utile, utilize it. So, uh, a poem should both please and teach. Now, you'll remember lecture one when I told you that's an aspect of pragmatic theories. Remember, pragmatic theories are interested in the relationship between the poem and the audience. And Horace is moving into pragmatic theories because he's interested in the impact of his poem. Does it teach and does it please? And that's one of the criteria he uses for good poetry. That is a pragmatic criteria relating to the audience. Now, the way he explains teaching and pleasing, Horace says that old men insist that poetry teach morality. Young men, on the other hand, insist that it should please and entertain. Well, Horace says, the best poets will combine the two. They can make everybody happy if they not only entertain, but through the entertaining, teach some moral. Now, the, quote, bastardized version of neoclassical theory is the idea of the sugared pill. Mary Poppins, it takes a spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down. And there is some truth to that, but that's unfair. That's kind of being nasty and trying to reduce them to something they are. But there is some truth. I mean, through entertaining, we are taught. It does work. And I, by the way, Americans believe that they should learn through humor. If you go to Europe, you don't have to make jokes as a professor. You're going to fail in America if you don't tell jokes. So, and in that sense, oddly, we, we agree with that, that you've got to teach and entertain. Now, Horace says that poets who do this successfully will win both fame and fortune. If you can teach and please, it's practical, too, because people will patronize you. To best achieve this goal, poetry should be both concise and realistic. Neoclassical theorists like concision. They like short poems. Now, Virgil, of course, wrote an epic, but most neoclassical poetry is short because it believes in wittiness. It's through wittiness, through maxims and proverbs that you can teach and please. Realistic, they believed that the, that the work of art must be true to nature and to human nature or it won't teach and please. So neoclassicists are not into fanciful kind of things. That's more romantic. They're into uh, something that's realistic and that's true to life. All right. Horace also laid down some rules for drama, specific rules for drama that have been very influential. First of all, according to Horace, plays, and also epics, should not begin at the beginning 
but should plunge into the middle of things. Don't begin your epic or your tragedy with the beginning of the story, the birth of Oedipus. Begin in the middle of things. The famous Latin phrase, en medias res. Many of you probably learned that before. Do not begin at the beginning, begin in the middle. The best example of an ep but the best example would be tragedy first, Oedipus. Oedipus does not begin with his birth, it begins with that day when he discovers who he is. It's beginning in the middle of things. What about the Iliad? The Iliad is purportedly about the Trojan War, but it actually starts in the last year of the Trojan War. It begins in medias res, rather than beginning at the beginning. And here's something people don't realize. He said, the, the Latin phrase for in the beginning is ab ovo which means from the egg. And it's a reference to, to, to uh, Homer's Iliad, because the real source of the Trojan War was when Helen was stolen away. And because Helen was born of Zeus in the, in the form of a swan raping Leda, Helen was born as an egg out of which she hatched. So don't begin from the beginning, from the egg of Ovo, jump and medias res like Homer did, or like Sophocles did. Another quick one, plays should consist of five acts. There's something we see in Shakespeare. Modern people change that, but for a long time, plays were five acts. Horace decided that. Also, they should not end with deus ex machina. In this sense, Horace agreed with Aristotle, no deus ex machina. Another one, the chorus and choral songs should serve an integral function. Now, I haven't had much time to talk about the chorus, but the chorus in a Greek tragedy would comment on the action. They would sing or chant to the action. Now, what he said is, when you use a chorus, don't just have them merely commenting as like a, a relief. Whatever they say should be organically linked to the play itself. This is another idea of unity, of or organicism. The best example is Broadway musicals. Old Broadway musicals were not very unified. You'd have the story and then a song, and they would not be linked together. Rodgers and Hammerstein, very Horatian, were the ones in Oklahoma to completely link the choral songs to the plot of what's going on. That was a very Horatian move that Rodgers and Hammerstein did when they integrated the chorus into the action, rather than just saying, let's stop for a song and go back. So that's very Horatian. Now, the above four criteria, again, express an organic view of drama and, and of poetry in general. Again, you notice Horace is influenced by Aristotle. Like Aristotle, Horace insisted that each part of a play be directly and intimately related with all other parts and with the work as a whole, an organic whole. All right, two more quick bits of Horatian advice that have entered our language. You, I bet you've heard this, but didn't know where it came from. First, Horace counsels against tacking on elaborate, unnecessary descriptions merely to impress your readers. He calls these excrescences purple passages. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Young poets always, or young poets and writers love to throw in these descriptive passages that have nothing to do with going on just because they like the sound of it. That's called a purple passage, and that's something Horace invented uh, for people that use heightened language without any reason to. That's a purple passage. The second one, Horace also counsels against starting your work with epic promises. Don't promise to do great things and then not deliver. Because if you do, people will say, the mountain labored and brought forth a mouse. There's an example, by the way, of Horatian wit. Notice a nice turn of phrase. That one translates well. Others don't as well. That one does fine. Finally, Horace comments in his Art of Poetry on the nature and the duties of the poet. According to Horace, the true poet combines genius and art. That is, he is an inspired craftsman. Both of them are important. In this sense, he is like an athlete who needs both native ability and rigorous training. To a certain extent, you've got to be born an athlete. You've got to have the capacity that you're born with. But if you don't also practice and train yourself rigorously, you're not going to be a good athlete. The same is true with the poet. To a certain extent, you're born with it, but if you don't practice the craft, you're not a poet. Indeed, I really would say that for neoclassical people, they tend to put art just a little bit above genius because they're really into rules and regulations and doing it with decorum. The artisan poet, above all, must never be mediocre. 
If you're a mediocre poet, the neoclassics are going to cut into you with wit. You better watch out. They said, while a mediocre lawyer might still win his lawsuit, Horace says, if you're a mediocre, mediocre poet, you're a laughingstock. You might as well put it in the closet for nine years, like he told the Piso boys. The best poets, Horace says, make it look easy. Their works are so perfect and unified that the reader feels he could do the same. Though, of course, he could not. But that's the sign of great poetry to a neoclassicist. When it looks easy and simple, but if you tried to do it, you couldn't. Read Oedipus the King. Everything is so simple and straightforward in that play. Try to do that, you'll never be able to. So that's something neoclassical. Make it look easy. Now the role of the poet, Horace admits, is difficult. Especially the role of the dramatist who's on a public stage. Because he has to please an often vulgar crowd while staying true to his art. Sort of like Horace, please the rich people, but also don't prostitute your art. Well, also, I mean, if it's on stage, you've got poor people there, too. People that are unlettered, so to speak. So, again, it's very difficult because you need to be able to please all different people. See, Horace was very conscious of the social role of the poet. And he's got to realize that he is a social figure and he has got to please society. Finally, he's got to make a living without letting the love of money taint his soul. That's very hard to do. Again, most people, if they got money from the government, would get maybe a little bit sloppy and say, I don't have to really, you know, strive. Horace said no. Horace understood. And I remind you again of Shakespeare, who was able to, to, to make everybody happy, to appeal to everybody. Again, an amazing talent. Finally, Horace provides us with two contrasting views of the poet. There's a negative view and a positive view. Now, the negative view depicts poets as grubby, bearded, unkempt leeches driven wild by their poetry and eager to waylay innocent bystanders into listening helplessly as they spew out their mad verses. Some of you may have had a friend like that. They just grab you and say, listen to my newest poem, and you're stuck. It's like if you've ever read The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. It is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three by thy long gray beard and glittering eye. Wherefore stoppest thou me? This old guy grabs onto you and makes you listen to his story about his sea journey. So that's the comic view. That's a negative view. And actually, the negative view sounds a lot like Plato's possessed poet, doesn't it? The mad poet who doesn't cut his hair or cut his fingernails is just always dirty and grubby. And a lot of people feel nowadays that's what a poet should be, right? But... Horace contrasts this with a positive view. And I would argue that his positive view is meant as a rebuttal to Plato. He leads us in with a negative view and then ends with a positive view. The positive view is that the poet is the great civilizer of humanity. He tamed the beast within and established cities, laws, and moral rules of conduct. In other words, this idea that poets are the ones that not only create poetry, but they create society out of their imagination. Uh, some of you know the great myth of Amphion. The story, do you know how the, the walls of Thebes were built? The story is that Amphion played his pipe so beautifully that the stones moved of themselves to form the city of Thebes. Here is an idea of poetry. We, we say today, music calms the savage beast, right? You're familiar with that cliche. It's kind of that idea that poetry civilized us and makes us better people. It sets down rules of conduct because it can teach and please. Indeed, the poet for Horace is in some ways a divine oracle, a mouthpiece of the gods, and he deserves honor and fame. This may be a little cut on Socrates. If any of you have ever read Socrates' Apology, Socrates said that philosophers should be put on the public dole because they're great public servants. He might be sort of playing with that and saying, actually, poets are the ones who are due honor and fame. Now, we will encounter again this ennobled, almost deified view of the poet in the great defenses of poetry we'll look at. Later on, Sidney and Shelley both wrote defenses of poetry, and part of their defense plays on this Horatian idea that the poet is actually a prophet, a divine person, somebody that forms civilization. We will see that idea again elaborated more fully. All right, in our next lecture, we will turn to Longinus and look at his definition of what sublime poetry is.